dad's great. Thank you for asking. Both my parents, mom and dad, are doing fabulous. Uh, they're both like the Ever Ready Bunnies. They just keep going and going and going, and it, it's just a joy to be with them. My, my dad's a fascinating guy. He 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 is warm and and genuine and embracing. He loves being with people. He's always enjoyed uh, telling his story and talking about the things that he's done in the wine industry. But just being around him is a super, super comfortable thing. Uh, I've seen that since I was a child, right? He, when, I, when I would watch him bring people through our home for dinner, and you have to remember this is the early days of the wine industry, and my father had befriended, you know, Alexis Lachine and Frank Schoonmaker and Robert Mondavi and Baron Philippe and his daughter, the Baroness. And these were the people that my father would bring home for dinner. My brother and I had no idea who they were, but they were all fascinating individuals. And watching my father interact with these people was a joy. I've never forgotten it. It's a, as I said, I'm flattered that you say that I'm I'm like him in some ways. But uh, you know, we're in the wine business. We get to talk about these things that we're doing that are fascinating and interesting and bring smiles to people's faces. And uh, it's a joy for it's a joy for our family. We all enjoy it. It's kind of a fascinating history. Um, both, and you'll hear me refer to us and we often because this is a family business and a lot of family members involved. And it is an us and a we, uh, not an I. No, no, no I in team, if I remember that correctly. Uh, both of my grandfathers started out in the retail business in Chicago, uh, one on the north side of the city and one on the west side of the city. And then we reverse migrated up the channels. We went from retail to wholesale to import to export to winery ownership in about 40 years which was an interesting path. The wine industry has changed dramatically in that time. But many of the uh, concepts, the original concepts or the original ideas around consumers and consumer choice and what they like and what they don't like and how they choose, many of those ideals are still applicable today. We're fortunate that we've gone through all of those channels and learned, hopefully learned some things along the way that we apply. Um, but it, it, it's a fascinating history. I'm not sure if there's any other family that has migrated up through all of the channels from retail all the way through to winery ownership, but it's a, it's a highlight of my father's tenacity and perseverance. You know, he had this idea in his head that he wanted to bring wines to the table of the American consumer and, and maybe affect their choices in some way, shape, or form for the better, hopefully, and, and maybe... Uh, bring a smile to their faces because he may have introduced a, a, a wine or a place that was new or unique or different, and that was his that that was his joy and continues to be his joy today. We still have fabulous conversations about wines. Um, in, in the last five or six years, I've been bringing some Burgundies uh, to our table, and just when I thought that I've found something new, so to speak, uh, I'll, I'll open a bottle, put it on the table with my dad. And he'll say, oh, I remember so-and-so from this place. He knew every single one of them. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and it just goes to show that the, the, the industry truly is multi-generational. Uh, history repeats itself in many ways. And so we've, we've been lucky. We've been very fortunate to participate in all the tiers. And we think that it may have created some opportunities and some advantages for us along the way. So we have Rutherford Hill Winery in Rutherford, Rutherford Appalachian. We have a magnificent, interesting um, vineyard, hillside vineyard in Rutherford. We have Chimney Rock, which is Stag's Leap District, uh, which has some fabulous parcels and great soil uh, microclimate uh, composition. We have uh, Episode, which is our little teeny tiny jewel in the crown that comes from a very specific hillside vineyard and a very specific valley floor vineyard that are put together Bordeaux varietals. Uh, we have Sanford in Santa Barbara, which is, a, again, a completely different microclimate soil composition. We also have Clipson in Washington State, our most uh, recent uh, acquisition, which is, again, a, a vineyard that was originally uh, planted, and the fruit was sold to other Washington uh, winemakers, iconic wines and winemakers. And we just made our, our first wine called Under the Clipson Label from that vineyard, which has been just a joy, um, the process from start to finish. Uh, we have Terlato family vineyards in Frioli, uh, in where we're making Pinot Grigio. So, and then Domaine Terlato Chaputier in Australia, which is a joint venture with Michelle Chaputier, and I and uh, I think I got them all. Hey, you guys get around. Uh, we, we've been busy. Uh, yeah. My dad was busy for many years. <laughs> it's, my brother and I are busy now too. Yeah. It's fun. Interestingly enough, I had no intention of coming into the family business. Uh, I went to. 
law school and business school, and I had intended on doing something entirely different and realized at one point in my life that, you know, here was this man next to me who was fascinating and innovative and entrepreneurial, and my brother was already working in the business, and they were enjoying their time together, and I realized that I was missing the opportunity to be part of that orbit. And so I kind of stepped in. I never looked back. Uh, but it was not my original intention. My father never uh, never pushed us to go into the business, nor, neither my brother or myself. He wanted us to come to it naturally, which was incredibly disciplined on his part because he's such a family man. You know, family is everything for him. And, and I suppose the easiest thing would have been for him to frame this and say, I'm doing this for you and I really want you to come into the business. But he never did that. He allowed us to come to it at our own pace, at our own moment, uh, and it made it, it made it much easier for sure. Both of us, my brother and I, absolutely. We, we, there, there was no, hey, here's your office, you know, welcome aboard. Uh, we were expected to be the first one in the morning showing up, the last one leaving at the end of the night, work hard, uh, prove ourselves, so to speak. Um, you know, family businesses are interesting that way. I think it's important to generate trust uh, amongst the people who are part of the team. And we didn't want to have family members in the business that just showed up and said, I'm here. Uh, We always felt, my father made it clear that it was his preference, in fact, his requirement that my brother and I work hard and uh, create value for the business. And not just because our our name was Trelato, but because we were kind and we were thoughtful and we were hardworking and tenacious and persistent, all those things that you would want. And I got some great advice from Michael Benedict, who was the one of the founders of the Sanford and Benedict Vineyard. You know, in my enthusiasm, I would bring a dozen wines out, out to Sanford and sit at the table and, and taste with him. And he said, you know, these are all beautiful. Uh, thank you. This is very gracious that you shared all these wines. But next time, is it possible that we might maybe just taste three or four? He, I'd really like to spend, he said, think about the person who made those wines, who crafted those wines, who grew those grapes. We're probably not giving enough time and attention to the wines, given the amount of effort uh, that went into making them. And so let's sit down and talk about three or four instead of a dozen. And and then maybe we'll have four or five dinners, not two. And I never forgot that. So you're right. People walk into a room, a tasting, there's 50 wines. How do they wrap their mind around 50 wines? So I, it's kind of like when, when I invite people to our, uh, a dinner at our home, my people say, how many people do you think should be at a dinner table? More than the graces and then less than the muses. Mm. <laughs> it's, you know, that, that's the number that works. If you really want to have a meaningful conversation with somebody and dive deep into a topic, four to eight. It's a good number. <laughs>